Hi and welcome to this video um, which is part of the TY Higher Level Maths Coordinate Geometry of the Line Revision Module Series. So this series of videos have been put together to help you to revise the coordinate geometry of the line section that you would have covered at Junior Start Higher Level and to help you as you move into the Leaving Start Higher Level Maths course. So this video today is going to go through the formula which are available in your log table. So as we're working through, it will be a good idea for you to have your log tables beside you. So the four different equations we're going to focus on are the length and distance formula, the formula for the midpoint of a line segment, the slope of a line and equation of a line. So in your formula and tables book on page 18, we'll be working with this particular section. So everything beyond that will be covered um, in Leaving Cert Higher Level course. So all we need to be aware of for Junior Cert Higher Level is down to the equation. So also note that there is a picture at the top of the page which can be really, really useful. This picture shows two points. So it shows us, first of all, how to label the points. So here we have P, which is X1, Y1, Q, which is X2, Y2. It also gives us a really important piece of information here, which is 0, C. And that will link to the equation of the line down here. So that letter C is linked in here. So we'll cover that in more detail. But be aware that it's not just the four formula that is really important, but that little picture will also be of great benefit to you. So let's just look at some terminology. So a point is made up of an X coordinate and a Y coordinate. As you're working through questions, it's important to understand, are they asking for a point? Are they asking for the X or are they asking for a Y? So you need to make sure whatever the question is asking for, that's what you give it. So our point is X comma Y given in a bracket. So a line goes on forever in both directions. A line can be named after two points that are on the line. So for example, a line that contains the point AB can be written as line AB, or they can simplify this and give it a single letter, for example, L. A line segment is then a piece of a line between two points. So if I'm talking specifically about a part of that line, remembering that the line goes on forever, I would use square brackets. So the line segment a, B. So this is all a reflection of what we've seen in our geometry section. The same notation and the same ideas exist. So let's get into example one. We're going to look at the first formula, which is the length or distance formula. You can think of this in two ways. This is the length of a line segment, or this is the distance between two points. Notice the notation here find a b and a b is in two straight lines this is the symbol for the length so although i've written beside here the length of a b it's also important to note that if this was not here would you still be able to recognize what you were being asked so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to take the points a and b so from the diagram a is 3 6 and B is minus six zero. So the X part and then the Y part. Just to remind you from the diagram, this horizontal axis is the X axis and the vertical axis is our Y. The first thing we're gonna do when we use any one of these formulas is we're going to label. So at the top of page 18, it teaches you how we can label it if you forget, but we simply do X1, Y1. So this is the X of the first point and Y of the second point. We then have X2, Y2. Notice that these are subscripts. Do not write them too big and do not write them at the top. They are at the bottom because if you look up here, this is very different to an X squared. So the next thing we would do if this was an exam, we would write down our formula and substituting that PQ for AB. So we label our points and then we write our formula X2 minus X1 squared plus Y2 minus Y1 squared. And that's all under a square root. Then we fill into our formula using our labels. So X2 is minus six minus X1 is three all to be squared, 
plus y2 is 0 minus y1 which is 6 squared and that's all under the square root. Cleaning that up we get minus 9 squared plus minus 6 squared and this works through. Nine, minus 9 squared is 81 minus 6 squared is 36. Whenever you square a number, be it positive or a negative, once it's real, it will always turn into a positive number because multiplying a minus by a minus will give us a plus and multiplying a plus by a plus will give us a plus. If you put this into your calculator as I've written it here, so this line here, you'll have no issues. If you decide to leave out those brackets, you will get the incorrect answer. So just be very, very careful with that. So this is the square root of 117. And putting that into your calculator, you'll be able to simplify it down to 3 root 13. If the question doesn't tell you, my advice would be to leave it in third form because it's the most accurate. There's no error in rounding. However, the question may ask you to do it to so many decimal places, or they might ask you instead to do it, um, leave it in third form. So just watch out for things like that in the question. So now let's take a look at example two, which is the midpoint formula. So find point D, which is the midpoint of the line segment AB. Remember those square brackets mean the line segment of AB. The formula we have on page 18 is the midpoint of PQ. It's given here. And we're going to, first of all, like the last example, write down our points. The next step is to label our points, x1, y1, x2, y2. Next step is to write the midpoint, so D in this case is equal to x1 plus x2 all over 2, y1 plus y2 all over 2. And now we do our substitution. So x1 is 3 plus minus 6 all over 2, comma, y1, which is 6 plus 0 over 2. So effectively, our answer here should end up as a point. So that's where the comma in the middle is. So we have 3 minus 6, we get minus 3 over 2, comma, 6 over 2. And that gives us, and this is probably the only time where I'd say, actually, if you want to put it into a decimal, um, or a mixed fraction, that's okay because it's harder for us to understand a number as a top heavy fraction. So in this case, minus three over two is actually minus 1.5 and then three. So if we go to, the, to go to our graph, that's about here. So that's my point D. So because I'm given my graph, I will label it. So you should be able to see that roughly that's, well, exactly that's half. Why I would suggest using the formula, regardless of whether you have the graph or not, is because like in this case, you could be looking for something that's um, kind of midway through a point. So, or sorry, well, not through a point. So kind of like think here, the fact we're here at minus 1.5. So you want to make sure that you're getting it accurate. So like it's not a hard formula, it's not hard to use, and you're definitely going to get all your marks for your workings. So if something goes wrong, if you're just eyeballing the graph, then that's going to be an issue in itself. So now let's take an example where we're calculating the slope using the slope formula. So here we have the formula m is equal to y2 minus y1 all over x2 minus x1. And they want us to find the slope of the line AB. So again, first thing we do, we write down our two points. We label our points x1, y1, x2, y2. m is the symbol or the letter that we use for slope. So anytime we see the letter m when we're dealing with the line, we're dealing with slope. So y2 is 0 minus y1 all over x2, which is minus 6, minus x1, which is 3. And that becomes minus 6 over minus 9. And you always want to simplify this down as much as possible. So three, well, minus 3 divides into the top two times and minus 3 divides into the bottom three times. Or you can think of a minus divided by a minus will give us a plus. So the slope in this case is 2 over 3. So let's do a little bit more about slope. <clears throat> as well as having that formula 
that we've just worked with and um, we can also calculate the slope of a line using rise over run so generally speaking we use rise over run when we're given the diagram or the graph of a line and we use the formula if we don't have the graph now just to just a word of warning with this rise over run formula when we use the rise over run formula, we must then take into account whether that slope is positive or negative, and we have to put our sign in to account for that. When we use the formula on page 18, that's not the case. We just plug in the points, and whatever our answer is, is our answer. So there's kind of drawbacks to this method, um, but there's definitely perks as well. It is much simpler to use when we have a diagram. And we're going to work through the same example using this idea of rise over run. Just before we talk about rise over run, let's take a look at the different types of slopes that we could encounter. So one that rises to the right. So I would always think of this as when you look at a line, you read it like we would read a line of text. We read it from left to right. So lines that go up as we look at them from left to right, they are positive. So this example here, we're coming up. Okay. So that is a positive slope. If you are reading from left to right and it goes down, that is a negative slope. There's two other different types of slopes that we can encounter and it's important to recognize these. A horizontal line has no slope and a vertical line has an undefined slope. So just bear in mind that when we talk about slope, a slope is a measure of how slanty a line is, not a very technical term, but how we think of it of how sloped a line is or in more kind of practical terms or more, you know, in a way we would talk about it in English, we would talk about how slanty it is. So, for example, if you have a horizontal line, it is not slanty at all. So it has no slope. If you have um, a vertical line, we are unable to define that slope. And we'll look at that in a bit more detail as we move into trigonometry. So let's do the same example again, but this time we're going to use the rise over run formula. So we have slope equals rise over run. So the first thing I'm going to do when I deal with rise over run, I'm going to look at this and I'm going to say, well, actually, this is a positive line because it is going up as I read it from left to right. The next thing I do, I can take any two points. So I'm going to take this point and this point, and I'm going to count how many boxes it rises. So it rises two over how many it runs, and that's three. So that gives me two over three. Now, one of the things that students tend to ask a lot when we're using this particular method is, how did you know which points to pick? And the answer to that is, you can use any points you want. I wouldn't suggest to use a point like this because it's too hard. It's probably five and a third, but like there's no point messing around with things like that. Let's use a point that is very easy to work with. So I'm going to take this out. So I picked the last one was that there. <clears throat> Excuse me, and that was nice. Uh, this one here we could use, or B. So let's use this one here and talk about rise over run and see if we get the same answer. So in this case, it rises one, two, three, four, over runs one, two, three, four, five, six. And again, it was positive. That simplifies down to two over three. Similarly, if we actually used A and B, so I just change colors for this. Okay, some people love working with the kind of endpoints, and that's perfect as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. So again, if we talk about it rising, it is positive anyway. Rises six and it runs nine and simplifying that down two over three. So the answer is it doesn't matter which two points you pick. I would pick a point that is a definite point. So one that when you look at it, you can 100% say, I know what that point is. I wouldn't take a point that's in the middle of a box, definitely a corner. And you can see that it'll work out the same no matter what. So now we're going to talk about the equation of the line. So when you're looking at page 18, you're going to see that there are two equations. 
So the general rule of thumb here is that the first equation there is for building the equation. The second one is for when you're given the equation. Now, that is not a 100% rule, but it is a very good rule of thumb to have. Um, it will get us through the majority of questions and we'll see where maybe we can work a bit differently. But in general, that first one that I've labeled one here, that is to build an equation. So if somebody asked you to get the equation, that's what we're going to use. And if we are given the equation of the line, the second one is what we're going to use instead. So just to be aware, um, in the first formula, it is y minus y1 is equal to m bracket x minus x1. So x1, y1 is a point, m is the slope, and then in equation two, it's y equals mx plus c. So the m again is the slope, and that c is called the y-intercept. And that links back to the picture at the very top of page 18 that I pointed out. You can see that that line crosses the y-axis at the point zero c. That means that whatever that c value is, it tells us the point zero c, which is known as the y-intercept or the where the line crosses the y-axis. So let's take a look. It asks us to find the equation of the line a, b. So they're asking for the equation. So we're going to work with number one. So I'm gonna take this one here. So this is the formula we're working with. So just be careful, this is the one time that just knowing what you're asked isn't just necessarily enough. You have to have a little more knowledge to be able to pick which of the two formulas we want. So again, of the equation AB, we're going to first of all take our points AB and we're going to label it X1, Y1, X2, Y2. Now, the formula for the equation of the line is Y minus Y1 is equal to M bracket X minus X one. So this is fine. I have my y we don't sub in, y1 is here. Um, m, okay, so actually we don't have m. So if you can remember back, m stands for slope. So actually the first thing we need to do is work out the slope of this line. You can do it using rise over run or your points. So I'm going to use the points. So the formula is y2 minus y1 all over x2 minus x1. And working that through is 0 minus 6 all over minus 6 minus 3. Get minus 6 over minus 9. And that simplifies down to 2 thirds. So now I have m. I can sub in. y minus y1 is 6 equals 2 over 3 bracket x minus 3, which is x1. Now, because of the way that slope is a fraction, I'm going to multiply both sides by the common denominator, which is 3. They cancel. And that gives me 3 times y minus 6 is equal to 2 times x minus 3. We multiply that out. 3y minus 18 equals 2x minus 6. They didn't tell us what form to have. So the only piece you have to make sure you do is to bring these two constants together because they have to come together. But we're going to rearrange this as 3y. I'm going to add an 18 to both sides. So 2x minus 16 plus 18. 3y equals 2x plus 12. Okay, so that's our equation of the line. It can be given in any form if they don't specify exactly which one, but it's important to note that in a lot of cases, when we are getting the equation of a line, we are gonna to have to first get the slope and then work through the equation. I use the slope formula here. However, you could have used rise over run. Just to remember, using rise over run, you have to take into account whether that line it has a positive or a negative slope.